hello and welcome to this new video in this video I will solve the three exercises of chapter one I hope you tried at least to solve them so the first exercise the first exercise we have to prove by going back to the definition that the function 1 over z is analytic on C star so it's analytic at every point different from zero but recall two fundamental identities. Uh, the first one is the geometric series expansion of 1 over 1 minus z. Okay, This is a really a fundamental result. But pay attention to the domain of validity of this identity. Uh, z should belong to the unit disk, to the open unit disk. So the radius of convergence is 1 here. Okay, because if you put z equal 1, for example, or 2, let us say, then you will get here 1 plus 2 plus 4, etc. It's infinite, and here you'll get minus 1, so you'll get a contradiction. Okay, so this expression is not true for any z. And since we can uh, differentiate term by term inside the disk of convergence, then we get a power series expansion of 1 over 1 minus z squared. Okay? So now let us go to the proof of uh, the, uh, the exercise. So take any point different from 0, call it A, and write 1 of z as A minus A minus z, or if you like, z minus A plus A. Same, same thing, actually. And now factor by A. If you factor by A, you get what? We get 1 over a in the numerator and 1 over a minus z over a in the denominator. So if you apply the first identity, we get this series, provided, of course, the modulus of this fraction is less than 1. Now, we can write a minus z as minus z minus a, so we get minus 1 to the n, actually, and here we get a to the n. On the denominator if we multiply by a we get a n plus one so we get a series a power series about a whose coefficients are given by this expression and the radius of convergence is actually the modulus of a and which is not zero okay and note that the radius of convergence here, modulus of A, is what? Is the distance between A and 0, which is the only singularity of 1 over Z. And this is a general fact that we shall uh, explain in the next chapter. Okay, so we proved that 1 over Z is analytic at A for every A in C star. Okay, so 1 over Z is analytic on C star. Okay. So this concludes the first exercise. Now, the second exercise, we have to prove what? That the ring of analytic functions on an, on an open connected set is an integral domain. And I have to say that, first of all, the result is not totally trivial, and it's not true for arbitrary functions, even continuous and even C infinity. So let us start by giving a counterexample. And to simplify, I gave an example of functions defined on R, but of course you can give other examples for functions of a complex variable. Okay, so <clears throat> take for example the function which is 0 for t negative and t if t is positive, and take it symmetric with respect to the y-axis, call it G. So the graph of F uh, is drawn here in green, okay, 0 then t, it's continuous of course. And the graph of G is simply the symmetric of the graph of F. Okay, So what do you have here? F of times G is always 0, right? Because if T is negative, 0 times minus T is 0. If T is positive, T times 0 is 0. So F, G is identically 0. However, F is not identically 0, and G is not identically 0. So this is a counterexample. <clears throat> And we can, of course, take C infinity. Even if the functions are assumed to be C infinity, the result is wrong. So remember, 
consider this function, which is 0 if t is negative or 0, and e to the minus 1 over t if t is positive. We already encountered this in a previous video, and uh, we observed that it's actually c infinity, and all the derivatives at 0 are 0. Actually. And this is something that you can check. Try to, if, you, if you want to prove that, you can use induction. Right? So you can prove by induction that f is of class cn. Because the only problem is at 0. Okay, but if you differentiate, you'll get, for example, 1 over t squared e minus 1 over t, and this also tends to 0 at 0, because the exponential always wins. Okay, so, and g is simply the symmetric of f with respect to the y-axis. So the graph of f looks like this. It's 0, and then it slowly increases. All the, ta the tangent is 0, of course, at 0, as we observed. And then it's, incre it's increasing, actually. It changes convexity at some point, at 1 half, actually. And then it goes, as t tends to infinity, it, the f tends to 1. So y equal 1 is a horizontal asymptote. And g is simply the symmetric of this. It's in red here. Okay. So here again, we have two c infinity functions whose product is 0, but none of them is identically 0. Okay. Now, let us go back to the exercise, to the proof of the result, okay? So, suppose that the product of two analytic functions is zero. And suppose that f is not identically zero. We have to prove that g is identically zero, necessarily. If f is not identically zero, then by definition, f does not vanish at least at certain point z zero, okay? Now, since f is continuous at z0, then f does not vanish on a neighborhood of z0. And this is something that you proved in the topology course. And we just need continuity here. Don't need the analysis of f, just continuity. So continuity at z0 of f implies that f does not vanish on a certain neighborhood u of z0. But now, since the product is always 0 and f is not 0, then necessarily g vanishes on u. Okay, just take this equation, pick z in u. This product is 0, and the first one is not 0, so necessarily the second one is 0, because you can divide by f of z. Okay, so the first conclusion is that g vanishes on a neighborhood of u. Now, the principle of analytic continuation, because g is analytic, implies that g vanishes on omega, because omega is connected. Okay? And... That's it. This is the result. And note that we didn't need the analysis of f here. So actually, we proved something more general. If we have two functions whose product is identically zero, and one of them is analytic, and the other is just continuous, then one of them is identically zero. Okay. So we, we don't need the, the analysis of both. Just need the analysis of one of them and the continuity of the other one. Okay? <clears throat> now, third exercise, it's standard. We always ask such questions in the exam. First question, find all analytic functions from the unit from the open unit disk into C that satisfy that satisfy this, this equation, f of 1 over n equal f of minus 1 over n equal 1 over n squared for all integers big or equal than 2. Okay, now let us start by guessing something. If you replace 1 over n by z, okay, we get z squared here. So already z squared is a function satisfying this equation. Okay, so if we call g the square function, then, of course, g is analytic because g is a polynomial. And we, we have that g and f, if f is such a function, coincide on the set 1 half, 1 third, 1 over 4, etc., which is a set having 0 as a limit point. And 0 is inside the unit disk. So the principle of analytic continuation, since the unit disk is, is connected, the principle of analytic continuation tells us that f and g coincide. 
So remember that the principle of analytic continuation is actually a uniqueness result. Okay? So we conclude that f equal to g on the index. So the, there is only a unique function satisfying this requirement. Okay? It's the square function. Okay? Now the second question is a little bit more tricky. Let us try to do the same. Here, so let z equal 1 over n, just for the process of uh, searching for a candidate. Here, if we factor by n, we get 1 over n over 2 plus 1 over n. So we get z over 2 plus z. So z over 2 plus z satisfies the first requirement. Now, If we, if we replace minus 1 over n by z, we obtain another candidate, which is, which is minus z over 2 minus z. Okay, and these two functions are analytic. So let us first concentrate between, on, on the relation between g and f. Okay, so g, if, suppose that f is such a function so this, that satisfies the requirement we want to. Then f and g are two analytic functions that coincide on the set one half, one third, etc., which is which has a limit point, which is zero actually, in on, in the index. So, arguing as in uh, the first part, uh, f coincide with the g on the unit disk. So f equal to g on the unit disk. But however, now if you repeat the same thing with h and f, we see that f and h coincide on the symmetric of this the set was, that I call f. So it's minus one half, minus one third, etc which also has zero as a limit point. So the principle of analytic continuation tells us that f coincides with, a, with h. So we get what? We get f equal g and f equal h, therefore g equal h. So these two functions are equal. But this is not true. Okay? They coincide, for example, at zero, but they don't coincide at one half, let us say. These are two distinct functions. So we get a contradiction. Therefore, we have to conclude that there's no analytic function satisfying the requirement of question B. Okay? So the answer is negative. We there is there are no there's no analytic function. Okay? Now question C is very similar to question A. Of course, we already have one candidate which is signed by Z, just replace one over n by Z. So if you argue as in question A, we find, again, one analytic function which is signed by Z. Okay, so this concludes the exercises of chapter 1. Next uh, week, we'll start with chapter 2 on complex integration. Okay, thank you for your attention and see you next time.